Revelation 6. Matthew 24 and Revelation 6. That's a good idea, Brother Eugene. I think that we ought to do that. And then when we order our tracks the next time, we'll just have that put on there. Brother Eugene is full of a lot of good ideas and very faithful. I just wish that Brother Eugene would continue to remember to say we will receive the offering. We will not take the offering. Now, sometimes I've thought about it. Let's just take it. Amen? Let's just take it. And just go back and take it. And get what we need and then move on. But uh, until that time comes, uh, I, let, let's receive the offering, my brother. And... <laughs> With that shirt, everyone sees you. I just hope now that they hear you. Okay. <laughs> We're in uh, Revelation 6. We just uh, introduced uh, Revelation 6 last uh, Sunday evening. The reason I'm asking you to turn to Matthew 24 and then Revelation 6. Now, uh, if we had time, and, and we don't, uh, I would ask you to go back to Ezekiel. Uh, 36 through 38. I'd ask you to go back to Daniel 7 through 9. I'd ask you to look at Second, First, and Second Thessalonians for this reason. What you find in Matthew 24 and Revelations 6 through 19, you find that same thing taught in Ezekiel. You find it taught in Daniel. You taught it. Find it taught in First and Second Thessalonians. And here's what I want to hammer home to you. The Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. And if you'll compare Scripture with Scripture, it makes the Bible come open to you. And uh, so, uh, if you would do that. Now, I want to start out tonight by asking you, and we'll be going back and forth from Matthew 24 to Revelation 6. I don't want to burden you down, but I, and I shouldn't say that. How can you burden somebody down with a reading of the Word of God? Uh, Jay was joking with me a while ago. Uh, he said, you went 45 minutes this morning. And, uh, of course, I, I shot back at him. Well, if you'd have stayed awake, I wouldn't have had to been, hadn't went, hadn't went, <laughs> hadn't went that long. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but you know, I thought this. I thought about this. We'll go to a movie and spend three hours in a movie and not say a word about it. We'll... <laughs> No, because you would sleep through the whole thing. <laughs> just sit back there and listen, okay? And, just... <laughs> and we do a lot of things that uh, we'll spend hours doing, won't we? I'll go to a Tennessee football game, drive to Knoxville, walk a half a mile after I park, and go up and sit in them hard seats and spend three hours there and then walk all the way back fuss and gripe and complain about the way they played all the way back and not think anything about it. But we go to church and 30 minutes or 45 minutes is too long to sit and listen to the Word of God. Mm. Mm. The message this morning was primarily to unsaved people. What if there was someone here this morning that was deeply convicted about their salvation? Would you have wanted me to get make the message clear? See? And so I understand, you know, I, I understand about time and uh, so forth. Uh, the seed can only endure what the mind can process. But anyway, uh, I think it's important. So what I want to do tonight is I want you to see how Matthew 24, you can take and break it into three sections. And those three sections in Matthew 24 fit perfectly in Revelation 6 to chapter 19. They fit perfectly. Now let's begin by reading verses 1 through 3 in Matthew. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, uh, See ye not all of these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now look at verse 3. And as he sat up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, the disciples are very interested about the future. 
uh, Jesus was about to go away. They were not going to have Him. They were not going to have Him. They wouldn't be able to ask Him questions. So He had made some statements about the future that got their attention. And they wanted to know some things. I hope that's your desire. I want to know some things. I want to know about the Scripture. I want to know about the future. And so they said to Him and asked Him three basic things. Tell us, when shall these things be? When is the temple going to be destroyed? And when is it going to be overthrown? And of course we know in 70 AD, Titus came through and completely destroyed the city of Jerusalem. Not one stone was left upon another. And then, what will be the sign of thy coming? Now let me insert something here. The rapture needs no signs to let us know that it's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen. No man knows the day. No man knows the hour when our Lord is going to come. But there are signs to the children of Israel to know when the great, great tribulation is going to begin. You see, the first three and a half years is called the tribulation. The last three and a half years is called the great tribulation. Remember in Revelation 6 to 19, there are three sets of judgments. The first set of judgment are the seals, seven of them. Out of the seventh seal come the seven trumpets. When the seventh trumpet sounds, seven bowls or seven vials. The seven vials are the most intense. All these judgments will intensify until you get to the last seven and they will be part of the last half of the tribulation period, the great tribulation. So they said, show us some signs about your coming. When is he talking about? Not the rapture, but the revelation which will be at the end of the tribulation period. And then they said, when will be the end of the world or the end of the age? When is all of this going to culminate? When is it going to come to an end? They knew something about Daniel 7, of course. And they knew something about Ezekiel, of course. And so in their mind, they were wondering and they were asking questions. And so Jesus begins to answer those questions. All right, now I want you to follow with me. And I'll not keep you long tonight because I want to read Scripture. Because basically tonight what I want to do is to set in your mind what will help us to study the rest of the book of Revelation. Matthew 24, there's three separate sections to Matthew 24 that talk about the tribulation period from beginning to the end. Now, look at Matthew 24 and read with me, and then I'll ask you to turn to Revelation. Read with me verses 5 through 14. Now, verse 5 through 14 of, Revel of uh, um, Matthew 24 describe the beginning of sorrows. These are the events that will take place immediately after the rapture. Now, read with me. Verse We'll actually begin in verse 4. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. You compare that with chapter 6, verse 1, 2, and 3 of Revelation. The white horse rider who is a deceiver. Okay? Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. The word divers places there means many different places, and in many different ways. Now watch. All of these are just the beginning of sorrows. Can you imagine being in the tribulation period at the beginning and knowing that it's just the beginning? This is just the beginning. Verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Now he's talking to the Jews. Now remember, Matthew's written to the Jews and has the kingdom in view. So he's writing to the Jews. 
will kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many shall be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets. There is a false prophet that arises on the scene in chapter 13. Remember that one that we've alluded to in our study? And he will deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. How many times have you ever heard somebody say, well, see, you've got to endure to the end to be saved. This is talking about the tribulation period, talking about the Jews. <coughs> Not the age we live in. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then shall the end come. Let me just quickly give you a panorama of what's going to, of what's going to happen. The first thing that will happen is there's going to be a mighty angel. We'll see it. That will fly through the midst of heaven proclaiming the everlasting gospel. Not the gospel of the, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not the gospel of grace that we preach here. And we'll get into that. Then, there will be two witnesses. Some people say that it's Moses and Elijah. Some say that it's John and Elijah. I'll leave that up to the, the theologians. But they will minister. And they will be killed. But as a result of their ministry, 144,000 Jews, all men, all virgins, will preach during the last half of the tribulation period. Now there is uh, disagreement and there is different ideas as to what all that entails. And we'll try to give you the different ideas as we get to them. But uh, with an open heart and with an open mind. So the gospel is going to be preached and this is the way uh, that it will take place. So now remember this is the first half of the tribulation period. Now turn over to Revelation 6. Revelation 6 and read with me and I'm going to ask you to read with me or follow along with me as I read the entire chapter. See how it fits what Jesus said about the beginning of sorrows. And I saw when the Lamb... Now who is the Lamb? Jesus. Now keep in mind who is opening the seals. Jesus. He can't be the white horse rider because he's opening the seals. So it has to be the Antichrist as we looked at last week. And I heard as it were the noise of thunder. Now remember we said that talks about coming judgment. One of the four beasts saying come and see. Now what he's saying is if you weren't with us last Sunday night what he means is this. Two things. Be going is one thing, but the next thing he's saying is this. Give close attention to what is going to happen. I want you to understand. I want you to be able to decipher these events and the meaning of them. So, if it's important to know and study prophecy in that day, it's certainly important in this day. Now verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. This man is setting out to conquer the world. How would Jesus uh, fit into this? You see, now he will, of course, a bow but no arrows. He will set up his uh, regime peaceably through deception. But now remember, the Jews will be made to believe that He is the Messiah. And we'll get into all of that when we get there. Now watch. That's the first seal. It goes forth conquering and to conquer. But remembering what we read in Matthew, look at verse 3. And when He had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out a horse that was red, or... There will be wars and rumors of wars. Isn't that what Jesus said? And power was given to him that set their own that he should take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there were given unto him a great sword. Antichrist will make a pact 
with the Jews for seven years. They will receive him as the Messiah, but he will set up his regime. And when he does that, later on, he's found out for who he really is. And then all kinds of things break out. Now look at verse 5. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, lo, a black horse, famine. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. I've said to you this before. Let me say it again. Some of you have not been with us. A man will work all day long, and he'll only be able to buy enough bread. And by the way, the bread is not what it's not colonial bread. It's the kind of bread animals eat. If you look at it carefully, that's all he'll be able to buy and purchase for a whole day's wages. Bread that would normally be given to animals would be thrown out uh, to the animals. Uh, notice in verse five again, he talks about. Uh, a pair of balances in his hands. Uh, this is very important. We'll look at it a little bit later on. Now verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat upon him was Death. And hell followed with him. Death claims the body. Hell claims the soul. Okay? Power was given unto him over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. And he had opened the fifth seal. I saw unto the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? White robes were given unto every one of them, and it was given, or it was said of them, that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens of the rocks and of the mountains, and said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of, his, of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? These verses perfectly correlate with Matthew 24, the verses that we just read a while ago. Now go back to Matthew 24 with me. Now remember, first of all, we have the beginning of sorrows in Matthew 24, 5 through 14 and Revelation 6, 1 through 17. Now, in verses 15 through verse 18, we have a description of the great tribulation. The great tribulation. Read with me now verse 15 down through verse 18. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's in Daniel 9, 27, Stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Also 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you want more uh, information. Now remember, this correlates perfectly with what was said in Revelation 13 concerning the Antichrist, the false prophet, and so forth. Now verse 16. Now this is to the Jew. Then let them which is in Judea flee unto the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. Things are continuing to escalate on a scale insurmountable. And now the tribulation period. Uh, the uh, great tribulation is beginning. Now turn to Revelation 8. 
Now, I'm not going to read. Our time's getting away. I'm not going to read uh, all of this. You do it when you get home. But turn to Revelation chapter 8 and let me continue to read and show you how these verses fit perfectly with the verses that we just read. Matthew, or I'm sorry, Revelation 8. And when he had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of about half an hour. Now remember, the three sets of judgments, seals, trumpets, and vials, okay? Verse 2. And I saw the seventh angel which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets, and another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it for the prayers of all of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire, of the altar and cast it into the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and the seven angels which had seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound the first angel sounded and there followed hell and fire mingled with blood and they were cast upon the earth and the third part of the trees were burned up and all of the green grass was burned up I'll leave that to, for you to read the rest of it at home and study it and compare it with uh, Matthew chapter 24 so we've got the beginning of sorrows we have the tribulation period but now turn back to Matthew 24 and let's read 19 through 31 and we'll see the Revelation of the Son of Man or the coming of the Son of Man the question that the disciples asked. Go back to Matthew 24 now beginning in verse 19. And woe to them that are with child and them that give suck in those days. Can you imagine a woman expecting how awful that's going to be for them? Or a woman that has a small child how awful that's going to be for them? Verse 20, But pray that your flight be not in the winter, nor on the Sabbath day. Why? Because the winter would be terrible. That would make it even worse, wouldn't it? And why the Sabbath day? Well, according to the Jewish law, you could only go a mile. You could only walk a mile on the Sabbath day. And so the Jewish way of looking at things is they would be breaking God's law. And of course we do know that in the tribulation period, God has returned to the Jew. Let me add this. Something else that will help you in your study. If you'll read carefully the book of Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, you will see Paul giving us Israel's past in chapter 9, their present in chapter 10, their future in chapter 11. And those chapters correlate with what we're reading. Verse 21, And then shall be the great tribulation, the outpouring of all of it now, such as not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The elect, the Jews. Remember, God's not through with the Jew yet. He will return to them. Also remember this, the saints are already in heaven. We've already been raptured. We've been taken to heaven. You say, what about the unsaved man? Strong delusion will be sent that he'll believe a lie that he will be down. And we'll get into those things a little bit later on when we uh, get to them. Verse 23, But if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, inasmuch as that if it were possible that they should deceive the very elect. But told, behold, I have told you before, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherefore the carcass is, there shall the eagle be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. This is in no way could be the rapture. No way could this be the rapture. Those things are not mentioned with the rapture in the Scripture, but they are with the revelation of Jesus. Verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, 
Then shall all of the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of the heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect, the Jews, from the four winds of one end of heaven to the other. Now real quickly, turn to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Begin reading in verse 11. And I saw heaven and open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and Righteousness he doth judge and make war. Is this a real horse, or is it, a, is it figurative? Does it really matter? Doesn't really matter. Well, let's say that it is a white horse. So? But a horse in the Bible, and especially a white horse, refers to tremendous power. Jesus is coming in power. And in righteousness he is judge and make war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and his head, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, is, is this the description of the Antichrist? Is this the description of the white horse rider in chapter 6? Absolutely not. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth doesn't come a bow, but what? A sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he tresses the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of Lords, our time is up. We'll stop there for uh, tonight, but I just wanted you to see uh, the comparison between Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 to chapter 19 and how they correlate and how they fit perfectly. Next week we'll begin uh, with the first seal and we'll finish chapter 6 next week and look at the different writers uh, that come out and look at them one by one. So I want you to be praying about that. Now, Where does wisdom come from? It comes from the Bible, doesn't it? Who gives you the wisdom to understand the Bible? The Holy Spirit. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to be a student of the Bible. And I want you to say, Lord, let your Holy Spirit teach me as I study your Word. Now, I will make you this promise as we study Revelation. I will try to give you Scripture. I'll not try to give you what I think because what I think doesn't mean spit. But it's what this book says that counts. Be a student of the Bible and when you make a statement, be able to back it up with Scripture. And then all you can do is leave it with the Lord. So in your study of Revelation, study, compare Scripture because the Scripture is the best commentary on the Scripture. Let's stand and we'll be dismissed in prayer.